Welcome to See Arthritis at the Canadian Rheumatology Association and Arthritis Health Professions Association Annual Scientific Meeting. I'm Maya. I am the Program Coordinator at Arthritis Consumer Experts and also a person living with rheumatoid arthritis. I'm joined today by Dr. Ray Young, who presented as a part of a very exciting session at the CRA called COVID-19 in Rheumatic Disease, Can We Recover and What Can We Uncover? She spoke on the topic of multi-system inflammatory syndrome of childhood, which is also known as MIS-C. Thank you so much for being on our program today, Dr. Young. Well, thanks so much for having me. So um, to start, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you are involved in rheumatology? Yeah, sure. So I'm a pediatrician I'm looking after kids with autoimmune disease, including arthritis and uh, rheumatic diseases. And um, it's actually, it's a very, it's interesting. I'll make it the short version of the interesting story. Um, but um, the, fo the focus of my work is actually research. So I'm a clinician scientist at SickKids um, and I trained in immunology basic research. And as you know, the immune system is so critically important in all of our rheumatic diseases, including arthritis. So as I was studying um, uh, in the lab, doing my PhD in immunology, I clearly recognized that I need to make it very, very relevant to the patients that I look after. Um, and as a pediatrician, um, the really one big specialty that screams out at you is pediatric rheumatology as the, uh, uh, as the area to, uh, to be in. Um, so it was uh, after a, a really kind of a fortuitous set of kind of surprises that led me to pediatric rheumatology. Um, it's a wonderful subspecialty with wonderful people in it, and the patients are lovely too, uh, with diseases that exactly need the type of expertise I have in the lab. So what I studied is exactly uh, uh, applicable to the diseases that I'm looking after, making it a really a lovely marriage of uh, what I, uh, the patients I see in the clinic, as well as what I study in the laboratory. That's great. It's a perfect combination and really ensures that research, you know, is meaningful and relevant to the patients and you know because you're working with the patients as well. Now moving to the topic of your presentation at the CRA, um, I'm wondering if you can explain to us what multi-system inflammatory syndrome of childhood or MC is and how it is associated with COVID-19. Yeah, sure. So it's a fascinating disease because for the longest time, at least at the very beginning of the COVID pandemic, um, we didn't think kids got severe COVID. In fact, they usually were asymptomatic or had a mild disease. But surely, shortly thereafter, during uh, the, the height of the first wave of COVID in the, uh, uh, in the EU, people started recognizing that children about a month after um, uh, COVID actually presented with this hyperinflammatory syndrome where they developed fever and they'd really develop the classic signs of inflammation, like redness, heat, and swelling in multiple organ systems of their body. And this, re this was very reminiscent of a disease that we see in childhood called Kawasaki disease. So um, people started calling it multi-system inflammatory disease, a syndrome of childhood, or MIS-C. In fact, there's an alphabet soup of names that people have given it from country to country. But it's really a post-COVID infection syndrome. So you get infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus about three to six weeks before, and then suddenly your body's immune system becomes a little hyperactive. And in some kids it's a little hyperactive, and in some kids it's dramatically overhyperreactive, leading to quite a severe presentation affecting their heart, as well as multiple organ systems. And some of the kids are sick enough to go to the ICU. Wow, so the implications are quite significant from this. Yeah. And now um, I'm wondering if there are any relationships between MIS-C and arthritis. So again, a great question, because we know that um, the lessons that we've learned in MIS-C are kind of all borrowed from Kawasaki disease, because it looks so much like Kawasaki disease. And is that a and form of arthritis? It's a form of inflammation or autoimmune disease. Right. And it affects the blood vessels all over the body. And about 10% of kids with Kawasaki disease develop arthritis. So arthritis is part and parcel of their development. And we have a very, very small and yet real percentage that develop um, ongoing forms of arthritis too. But this is exceedingly rare after Kawasaki disease. What we're seeing in Miss C is less arthritis. So instead of 10% of the kids developing arthritis and then going away after treatment in pre-pandemic Kawasaki disease, during the COVID pandemic, 
the kids have gotten much less arthritis. So it's the rare child that gets arthritis during this syndrome. And it, there is much more affecting their heart and much more affecting their gut. So most of them develop horrible abdominal pain or vomiting and diarrhea together with their fever and their rashes and their inflammation. Um, and it's really their heart and their gut, which is one, one of the main symptoms that are being affected right now. Okay. And uh, so you did speak to the relationship of getting arthritis after getting uh, uh, Miss C or Kawasaki disease, but what about an inverse relationship? Is there any evidence to suggest that maybe kids that already have an autoimmune arthritis might be more likely to develop Miss C after COVID? Yeah, again, a great question. And because the good thing is, even though we're talking about it right now, it's still exceedingly rare. So it's not something that you're going to see uh, uh, every day of your life. And even in amongst the kids that are getting COVID, the estimates, and again, these are just estimates right now, is that one in uh, two or 5,000 children that get COVID might develop the syndrome. And so the numbers are very, very rare right now. And I think I'd be guessing if I told you that kids are at higher or lower risk to develop it if they have had pre-existing arthritis, um, but we haven't seen that in the cohort that we have. So out of the children that we've seen in the, um, uh, at Sick Kids, and we've had over 130 kids now with Miss C since the pandemic began, I can tell you that none of them had had pre-existing arthritis. Um, but though the numbers are still small, we really need large numbers in order to be able to know whether there's a difference or not. Right, and uh, keeping in mind that there are still small numbers and preliminary data, um, are there other risk factors that seem to be uh, related to developing MIS-C? So it's a, another great question. I think many of those risk factors, like many things in, uh, uh, in rheumatology and arthritis, um, may be associated with how we're made. So genetically, how we're made, as well as the environment. So the early reports of Miss C is that it's actually more common in children from the Afro-Caribbean background. Um, but that hasn't borne out, at least in, the, um, uh, in all cohorts. It's definitely been reported in some cohorts. What we are seeing, at least in the Toronto cohort and the Toronto experience, is that there are kids that are from the South Asian communities are being more predominantly affected because before the pandemic began, at least for Kawasaki disease, it was actually affecting the East Asian or Oriental kids. And now it's much more the South Asian kids. And it may be associated with the environment because the South Asian communities are actually being affected just as a whole have been infected by COVID more. So it may be that there's more COVID in that environment leading to that. Similarly with our Afro-Caribbean um, uh, 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 communities. It may be that it's affecting those communities a little bit more. So there, I think there is still this balance and this debate and a lot of investigations need to still tease out the contribution of how we're made, what ethnicity we are born with biology wise, mm -hmm. and where we live. Because if our communities have more COVID in it, obviously we're going to have more COVID associated illnesses. Right, yeah, and if um, if the community is more likely to be working frontline positions because of socioeconomic factors or systemic racism, for example, it's, yeah, that's very interesting. Absolutely, critical factors, and we brought it to uh, attention because of that, and um, this is uh, quite clear that we need to address this as a society as well as as a medical community, because often we can tell um, from a postal code where kids are coming from, which disease, uh, whether, you know, the likelihood of it being Miss C or not. So it is a, is a very important factor that we need to take into account. Wow. And, and also, I, um, I recall from your presentation, I think you may have spoken about uh, certain age groups, like older children versus younger children. Can you speak to that? Yeah, so classically, before the pandemic, before COVID-19, um, kids with Kawasaki are affected um, uh, much younger. So they're about 18 months to two years is about the peak age of incidence. So these are really young children, usually typically under the age of five. Although we do see young children, um, it's interesting is that the demographics of it, so the age is a little bit higher for the kids that we're seeing with Miss C, especially during the second wave of the COVID pandemic. So that kids are about eight, to nine is really the average age that we're seeing right now. So it's a little bit older than what we're seeing um, uh, typically when it was younger. Okay. 
And, um, and moving forward, it sounds, you know, there's lots of uh, research still in the works. Um, mm -hmm. What research associated with COVID-19 and Miss C, or maybe just COVID-19, if you'd like, um, what research do you think is most important to, to explore moving forward? So I think there are so many unanswered questions and every answer I'm going to give is going to be biased, but I'll go ahead and be biased, okay, <laughs> is that as a basic scientist, I think one of the things that we don't understand is what is it about the biology that makes certain kids predisposed to getting severe disease versus non-severe disease for COVID-19? And similarly, why is it that they get mild disease at the very beginning? And then for, you know, a month later, why do they get um, uh, Miss C? And what is it that is about Miss C that makes it um, your immune system hyperreactive a month later? Like, what is it that's triggering it? It's a month later, it's like clockwork. It's pretty amazing. And Miss C, although we're talking about it like it's one disease, it's absolutely not one disease. There are some kids that get very, very mild Miss C, and there are some kids that get very, very severe Miss C, and they need to go to the intensive care unit. And I wish we had the crystal ball to be able to tell the difference, because when you look at them, when they come in, you really can't predict as yet. And it's important to look at the blood work. And that's why where biology comes in, and we need to just study the immune response and study and come up with good predictors that can partner with what we see at the bedside so that we can predict, we can have that crystal ball and predict who's going to be doing worse so we can intervene and give the right drugs earlier to prevent kids from getting um, sicker. Right. And so, and so there is some, some drugs or some treatment that um, is effective for Miss C? Absolutely. In fact, I think we have fantastic drugs. Again, this is borrowing from lessons that we've learned before from Kawasaki disease. So again, the typical drugs that we use to suppress the immune system and I can absolutely tell you that every single child that we've treated has done well. Um, and their res immune response has dampened uh, with basically um, IVIG is, is a, an extract of good antibodies from blood that we give um, in kids with Kawasaki disease that works for Miss C. And good old steroids, they also work for Miss C. They work beautifully for Miss C. Um, and as well as even biologic agents in the kids that are very, very sick and are recalcitrant to some of the treatments that we give, um, they respond well to these biologic agents too. So we have the drugs, we have the ability, we just need to be able to predict which kids we need to use them in and when we should use these drugs. Right. Well, it sounds like, you know, hopefully that'll happen. It sounds like there's lots of good research um, that you're involved with being done in this area. So um, lots, hopefully lots of new findings come out of it. Thank you for speaking about this subject today. It's really fascinating, really important, obviously, because thinking about little children being impacted like this is, of course, a very heartbreaking topic. And it's good to see that there's um, lots of work being done to, to address it. Thanks so much. I think it's uh, important. Communications is important. Spreading the news is very important and educating both families as well as caretakers alike are very important. So thanks for giving me this opportunity to chat with you and uh, be able to share some of this, uh, 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 some knowledge that we're learning and we continue to learn. So I'll look forward to updating this when we have more answers. Perfect. Sounds good. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.